Hello everyone, wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to another Fireside Chat. Today I'm joined with uh, Nitin, who is the VP of Product at Smartsheet. Nitin, thank you so much for joining me today. Hello, Alan. Thank you so much for your time and I'm excited to talk uh, at this uh, time. So uh, we were chatting about this a little bit before we went online, but you are a long serving member of the product school community. You are a veteran of the product school community. You've done chats for us. You've uh, been an instructor. You've done it all. Uh, but I'd love to know more about your personal story in product management. How did you get started in product? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Alan. Uh, calling me veteran sounds me old, but I'm really young. I'm really young at <laughs> heart. So, uh, yeah, I can tell you about my personal story. Uh, my my educational background is uh, I have my undergrad. I did my engineering in computer science and got my MBA as well as uh, enrolled into another master's degree. So I started off as a software developer, uh, dev manager for many first uh, many years of my life. Uh, many I was almost a dev, dev manager for six, seven years of my life. What I enjoyed the most was uh, I'm an extrovert. I enjoyed a lot of this driving business results. Uh, uh, conversation with customers, problem solving when I was a developer during my uh, first uh, two, three jobs. And these experiences or these skills really led me to moving into a formal role at Microsoft into a PM. And the best part about uh, being a PM at Microsoft was the role was multifaceted. It had aspects of um, deep technology expertise. I was working on the operating system, the cloud systems at those point of time, uh, defining uh, uh, you know user designs, understanding a very deep understanding of market economics, competitive landscape, customer needs. So I think that that really helped me, uh, you know, change my career from a software engineer, software dev manager into uh, product management. So that's that's really uh, the beginning of how I started my career in product management. And now you've climbed the ladder up to VP of product. Uh, what does it mean to you to be a VP of product? Because these titles, you know, they fluctuate across companies, across industries. Uh, so in your mind, what does it mean to you to be a VP of product? Yeah, I think that that's a, that's a great question. And it also, I think that the, the, the question is also relevant at what stage your company is whether your company is a private company, which is not uh, on listed on any of the stock exchanges, your company, a public company. So a company at a small, if you're a VP at a small startup, your roles, responsibilities, and the work you do is way different than what you would do as a VP when you are at a public company. Uh, so I think that is one big difference. But before I come to being what a, what a VP really does, I want to give everyone a listener, people who are tuned in, an aspect of what product management is, because I think it's very important to understand at a macro level what product management is. In my belief and a practitioner of product management for so many years, it is a mix of art, it's a mix of science, technology, insights, data, economics. All of this together is product management. There is just no one aspect of it. It's a combination of all this. And when I think about being a product manager, uh, a VP of product management spe specifically, it's almost like you have to be strong in multiple aspects on a time axis, that you have to be forward thinking. That means you're really good at strategic thinking. You can, you are a visionary, you can see the future. Second piece is you're great at execution. You are great at doing what is currently getting done in your company. And the third piece is learning from the past. Whatever has happened, whatever your teams have done, that are you learning from it to build a better team? So that is one aspect of what does it mean to be a product manager? A VP of product management is this axis of time, that forward-looking, current-looking, and learning from, from the past. And if I take it to another framework, big, big fan of frameworks, it is as a VP, you are responsible for multiple things in your core role. You're responsible for driving the vision you're responsible for defining the strategy. What is going to support that vision? That, for example, my vision is I want my company to make $5 billion in ARR. So that is the vision. What is the strategy behind uh, to in order to supplement that particular vision? Had a really strong sense of defining the design, 
It could be user design, customer design, all aspects of design. And the last particular piece is on execution, that how do you really help these particular things come up? So there is an access, there is a portion of this time, there is this portion of these core skills. And at the end, this is a multi-dimensional role. It's not trivial. What you really want uh, your uh, VP or leader to do in your company is be a very strong collaborator, ability to see how your product fits in into not only your space, but also your peer space, as well as the overall strategy. And the last one is really helping the overall company, as well as the industry, evolve the existing product and capabilities. So I think that is a really good sense of what a vice president of product management does at a public company. <clears throat> And, uh, well, uh, across the board, no matter what company you're in or what level you're at, one of the things we talk about a lot in product management is being obsessed with the problem and not with the solution. What are some of the problems that you're obsessed with at the moment? What what problems are you the most passionate about? Yeah, I think that that's a great question. If I, if I have to articulate what are the problems I'm really excited about is, number one, is... The, the first one is making uh, people efficient, making people productive, that whether it is a, a B2B, B2C, uh, any any kind of segment there, I think this this whole aspect of making, helping people save time and becoming more productive. The second piece is around making businesses more efficient. And uh, the, third, the third aspect really is empowering people, that people are able to see data, which is, uh, which is exposed through really transparent and scalable systems. These systems are inclusive. Uh, they don't have any kind of bias in those systems. Uh, scalable, have a deep, a deep sense of technology across domains and verticals. I think that is the first piece which I'm super excited about and which help the human race become better. And this is my philosophy, not only in terms of where I work, but also what I do, Alan, is I advise companies. I'm on board of uh, three companies right now. All the three companies, their mission is how do we become better? How do we become help businesses become better? How do we help people become better with productivity and things like that? So that is the first part on um, what I'm passionate about. And I think you had another question there, which was around expertise, that how do you build expertise? Is that right? Uh, no, not quite yet, but I'll okay. get to that in a sec. Uh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so um, actually, look, is, I'm, I'm super, uh, super excited about. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Um, so, well, we, we, I'd love to chat about expertise a little bit. Um, sure. One of the things that I was wanting to ask you about was as you've stepped into a leadership role, that mm -hmm. comes with uh, not a different skill set to that of product management, because all product managers are leaders in a way. But what additional skills have you had to develop or learn uh, as you've moved sort of higher up the ladder, um, as you've moved into a position of authority, has that kind of changed the skills that you use in your day to day? Oh, that, that's a that's a great question. And <clears throat> what I understand when you say position of authority, I think you mean someone like a VP at a public company or exactly. someone with yeah, I I get I get it. Um, you know, on a day to day basis, a lot of things don't change. That you are still expected to make data-driven decisions. Um, you are expected to be focused on your mission. Uh, you're expected to lead from the front with empathy, have very strong clarity. But what changes is, is the quantum of it and also the judgment call. That when you are, when you are relatively junior to your career, I think you make a lot of decisions with 100% of data. And as you step higher, the amount of data which is available to you may not be 100% available or may not be 100% accurate. And that's where this sense of judgment that what, like for example, right now, I'll give you a very specific example, crypto. Is crypto going to be the next big financial instrument or not? Is not very clear. There is no guideline. There are guidelines. Obviously I shouldn't say there is no guideline. There are guidelines, but it's, it's very, um, ambiguous it's very amorphous and that's where as a leader the ability to make decisions with very incomplete data is a super skill you need to build when you get into these leadership roles mm -hmm. the second thing is as i have gotten and risen up through the ranks i have learned a lot of new different skills 
my primary role was i was an engineering leader a product leader but specifically in the last 4 5 years i have gained skills in uh, semantics and syntax of merger and acquisitions uh, corporate development so that is an area i had never worked in and i did uh, a bunch of these big level acquisitions and you know and also during my time at um, my current employer and my and my past employer the second one is also that when you are working at a public company there are certain rituals or certain things you do like for example the quarterly earnings call that every 3 months you get in front of the wall street you share your numbers publicly saying hey this is this is how what our balance sheet looks like i think the learning the details of how the market works how the analyst relations are how do you prep for these a uh, quarterly earnings call is a fantastic opportunity for anyone who's getting into uh, this uh, this level or this scale and then uh, other couple of examples are uh, crafting the product strategy for the entire company not just your particular area because you are just not looking at your own area you're looking at how does this fit into the overall company strategy product strategy how does it really help me get to the one year three year five year vision how does it move the needle and also newer skills around marketing product marketing uh, monetization uh, financial projections go to market strategies uh, global expansion and i think all these six seven things which i have talked about i have really gotten a lot of opportunities and experiences thankful to all the employees where i worked and also my own startup which i did uh, during uh, during the last 5 years that these were skills i i didn't have exposure to almost 5 6 years back so i think these are the kind of skills and experiences i have gained especially coming into you know uh, moving more into leadership level in the companies Mm-hmm. And another really important aspect of leadership it's uh, not some, not just the impact that you have on your company or on your product it's also the immeasurable impact you have on the people who you're actually leading the teams that you're uh, influencing every day um what would you say are some of the marks of great leadership when it comes to being uh, a mentor for the next generation uh, how do you uh, how can product leaders stand out as great leaders for the next generation. Oh, wow, that that's a great insightful question. Let me let me let me just think about what are the most essential ones. Mm-hmm. If I if I think the biggest one the biggest one which comes to my mind is building a culture of trust and collaboration across the company. and from top to bottom bottom up uh, laterally whatever direction you go that is the biggest biggest marks of great leadership that that it's almost you are people together almost is almost you are there is a lot of camaraderie in the company with trying to get to a particular mission uh having a culture of uh, trust and collaboration and when you have that you can do magic you can really do magic that you can grow your sales you can grow your revenue there is nothing which is unsurmountable and one of the biggest biggest reasons companies fail is not because they don't have smart people is because the culture is not is not conducive to get the best out of people i think that's the biggest one in my mind so the uh, the culture of trust and uh collaboration and accountability so that is the number one i would say this i i will just just kind of share as as i'm thinking through this the second one i would say is having a culture where you measure people by the impact they create obviously the positive impact they create the value they bring and how how they are able to influence uh, others i think that would be the second thing which is very quantifiable that you can really measure how people are influencing how are they building impact and how they actually create value the third one which again is a really big skill in my mind from leadership perspective is being unflappable you will always have crises you will always have failures in those times how you manage to keep your cool how you lead from front with empathy and not try to uh, you know try to do a post mortem at that point of time but try to solve the problem and uh, take people 
uh, into confidence while that crisis is happening, I think that is really, again, a hallmark of a great leader, that being unflappable. And I'll give you one specific example, not trying to be political. I'm not a Republican or a Democrat, but someone like President Obama, that even if when the gravest crisis in the country were going on, but when you saw him on television or whenever you saw him in a public uh, domain, he was unflappable, cool, and not really responding to the crisis because that gave a lot of confidence to the 330 uh, million citizens in the country. And again, I'm not trying to make a political statement, but I'm just giving that as an example that how, how can you see someone who's unflappable in crisis? And then again, uh, other things, uh, you know, you asked about uh, marks of great leadership. How are you actually building your team? Not It's just not about your personal contributions, but how are you getting the best and the brightest of the talent to come and work for you and getting the best of them? How are you creating this? Um, how are you creating a team with a diverse set of experiences? Not only diversity in terms of the classic diversity, but diversity in terms of thought a thought process diversity in terms of leadership diversity in terms of experiences skill set and how are you retaining those people because especially when you are at a leadership level it's not just about the problem solving it's also taking people along and creating a structure and a framework within which you solve the problems and uh, last other last last ones here would be also to think about how do you build uh, quality um, how are you in communication with your teams, with your press, with the analysts, Wall Street, everybody. I think that's a very important aspect, the communication and ensuring accountability through scalable models. Whether your team is a, a team of five, whether it's a team of 180, whether it's a team of 18,000 or 280,000, which may be in one country, one geography, five continents, it really doesn't matter. At the end, you have to build that kind of scalability in your team through this accountability and the kind of frameworks. So again, a long answer to your short question. I can go on, on for hours what I think great leadership should be. But you know, these are these are the top uh, top characteristics which come to my mind as I think about them right now. A long answer, but all great stuff. So I think we're good. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I just picked up on in your in your answer there was about the importance of having di uh, diversity of thought in product teams and about how we should consciously be building teams that bring a different perspective, not just a room full of uh, engineers who have become yeah. product managers, because then they're all going to have that engineer's mindset. Um, one of the things that we've actually had as sort of an ongoing conversation within the community the last couple of weeks is the, the act of hiring people into your team that don't come from specifically a product management background. Maybe they were in marketing previously or they were, they're a UX designer. Um, as, as a leader giving advice to other leaders, um, what should you look for in a candidate who maybe doesn't have product management experience but yeah. has other skills that they can bring to the table so that you can bulk out your team with that diverse perspective? Again, I Alan, I'm so grateful to you for asking this question. Uh, I will, before I answer this question, I also want to give a context to the people who are listening in. I'm also a professor at University of Washington. I teach, I've been teaching there for many, many years. I've been teaching at product school and other areas, non-conventional schools. This matters to me a lot because what happens is when people are looking to fill a certain role, they have a certain fixed mindset that, hey, this is what I want. The way to look at it is, that there are a lot of these skills you can teach people. I'll give you a very specific example before I get into what are the kind of skills, you know, how you hire. That I was actually teaching a cohort uh, almost three, four years back. I had someone who was a US military veteran, a Marine actually, had just uh, gotten a, like, uh, had retired from the military uh, after 10 years of service, had done deployments and was trying to get into product management. And you'll all be great to know, I, Unfortunately, I cannot share his name, but he's a, a senior product manager at Gartner. And the reason, the way how he approached his career and while working with me was there are a lot of these leadership skills he had as part of his experience being a Marine. Leadership skills, um, ability to uh, handle ambiguity. Now, just think about you're a person in the military, you are in a war zone and everything is ambiguous, right? So 
lot of that skill on people management, on time management, dealing with ambiguity, problem solving, it's just not product. They have solved this at a much bigger scale. So the ability for him to take those skills, what he had and put that in context of product management was a great experience for him to sell his candidacy, candidacy for another role. So the first thing I always tell people is it is not essential. You need to have a uh, a computer science degree to be a product management. Absolutely not. What you need is a skill where you can simplify experiences for users. You can explain why the why are you building a product? Who are who is it? Who is it going to serve? What are the advantages of using the product? It is not about what particular. Yes, you might have an understanding of how to build it from a technology perspective, but the what, the why, and the when is the more important factor when you are def defining product management. So again, I'll get to you answering your question specifically on diversity is that don't just hire people from a computer science background. And I have nothing against people from computer science background. I am from computer science background. But when you think of product, uh, and that's the reason initially when I was talking about what product management is, it's a mix of multiple things. It's an art and science. It is technology. It's economics. It is market dynamics. It's data. And if you don't have people from those kind of backgrounds, and a lot of times it's also uh, uh, that if you're not able to see the big picture, you will not be a successful product manager. So that is very essential when you are building your own product teams or any kind of team that you are picking people with diverse set of experiences, diverse set of schools of thought, how to build product, whether it's B2B is completely different than B2C. So I think the more diversity you have, uh, the more beefier and deeper experiences you will build in the product. And at the end, your team should represent your customers. Our customers are don't, you know, they are not the same, right? They have different aspirations, different line of thinking, different schools of thought, and your team should represent that as well. So I think that is a very simple analogy that your team should kind of represent your customers. Your customers are worldwide. They are from everywhere in the world. Your team should reflect that because at the end, product managers are also the representatives of the customers in the teams, in the company. So that's that's how I see it. Again, long answer, long-winded answer to your short question. But as you can see, I'm, I'm really passionate about this area. So... Yeah, can't, no, I, can't I love the long-winded answer. So you're safe. Uh, I can imagine the the marine you mentioned. I imagine being unflappable was probably yeah. one of, one of his major skills as he moved Absolutely. into product leadership. Someone comes to him saying, "Oh my God, V1 has a bug," and he goes, "This is nothing compared to what I've seen. Like we, we've got this. Don't worry." Um, yeah. So uh, another of the things I wanted to ask you is that uh, product people in general love learning. Big lifetime li lifelong learners, all of us. Um, what are some of the things that you're learning about at the moment or some of the things that are on your list of things you want to learn about? Oh, wow. That, oh, yeah, actually, that that's also one of the things I would like to share. That That's a great question. That the learning should never stop. Just because you did your undergrad or your master's doesn't mean the learning has to stop. Uh, and the people who are super successful in life, I have seen are always, always learning. And it doesn't always have to be related to what you're doing for work. But I think if you're intellectually curious and you have a mindset that you want to learn things, a lot of these experiences help you build what you want to. Uh, what I am I learning these days, uh, there are two, three things I am trying to learn and become good at. The number one is area, I think I had done a talk also about this with product school, uh, plugin for product school. So there is a talk I had done almost two years back about reducing um, bias in AI and reducing bias in product. I think this particular piece of explainable AI that where your algorithms are explainable or not explainable and how do they uh, factor, you know, algorithms and experiences. I think that is that is one area I'm super curious about. I read a lot of uh, papers from the university and uh, like research on that, what is happening in the explainable AI part of the world. The second piece, which I'm learning is on more on the business side of things that how do you build a flywheel, uh, which um, helps you build a multi-billion dollar ARR business and helps you sustain and become beefier. Because as you see, um, if you have a run rate of millions of dollars, three digit millions of dollars or one digit or two digit billions of dollars in ARR, 
Um, building that over a period of time on a sustained basis and quarter to quarter is a very hard and in one sense unsurmountable at times. So ability to do that constantly, I think that is, uh, you know, that's the second thing I'm learning. And what I also do is I read, I, I read a lot. I read books, I read blogs, um, I listen to a lot of podcasts. So I think that's that's how I gather all this information. And one of the things I can share with the team very quickly, people listening in, is I don't watch a lot of TV. I've cut down my on my television time a lot. In the I'm not saying you should not, uh, you know, binge watch. You should absolutely. But television was something I thought was taking so much of my time. Once I cut down television, it really helped me evolve as a person and learn. So. If you can, try to read uh, more and cut down on TV. Excellent advice there. Uh, so I'm conscious that we're running out of time and the events team will smack me on the wrist sure. if we walk over. But I am going to sneak in just one last question. Uh, what's, uh, what's some advice that you would love to go back in time and give your younger self as you were embarking on a career in product? Yeah, that, that's a great question again. Uh, great finish. Uh, it's a marathon. It's, it's not a sprint. So... Pace yourself well. Uh, you have a career of 30, 40 years. So don't get intimidated by failure. So that is the first one. It's a marathon, not a small sprint. And play the infinite game. That when you, I think there's a book I can recommend. It's infinite play, finite play. I don't remember the exact name, but I think that's a brilliant book. That play the infinite play where you are playing constantly, not really worrying about the short-term results, but playing in the game so that you, you are there to learn and explore. Uh, be patient with yourself. Um, success is never overnight. It takes years and years. I'm still trying to be successful. I've been in the industry for 18 years now, and I'm still trying to find my path. So it's okay. It's, it's so you don't you're not defined by a timeline and things. So be patient with yourself. And the last one is success is a lousy teacher. Failure will teach you more as compared to success. So be comfortable with failure. I actually just had done a post on my LinkedIn around a year, like a month back on that. And I really believe in that, that failure will teach you much more things as compared to success. So that that's my four, um, you know, things to myself if I can do that, travel back in time and tell myself. Absolutely. I especially love the point about failure being a great teacher. Every time I screw something up, I think to myself, well, this is a good time. This is a, a good thing that I'll be able to talk about in future interviews when they ask me. So when was the time that you learned from failure? I'm like, I'm logging it. I know I'll, I'll have it. I'll have it ready. <laughs> Uh, so uh, that's all the time we have, unfortunately. Nitin, thank you so much for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat with you today. Thank you so much, Alan. And my shout out to uh, uh, folks at Product School, uh, Alan, Carlos, uh, Alejandra, everyone who, who I work with. You guys are doing so much for the community. And uh, I really appreciate what you are doing. And a lot of us who are with Product School think it's an amazing, amazing platform for people to come in and learn. So my best wishes to the whole team and all of you are listening in. Oh, thank you so much, Nitin. And I didn't even tell him to say that. He said it by himself. Isn't that amazing? <laughs>